Let's do this. This is Focus on Your Health. It's brought to you by Kingman Regional Medical Center in historic Kingman, Arizona. I'm T.G. Lafredo, and this week I am with my all-time favorite guest, Dr. Ken Jackson. Hey, Dr. Jackson, welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. I'm in your office. There's so much to talk about with you, and and you've delivered officially 85% of the population of Mojave County. Well, that's a bit much, but uh, <laughs> I've delivered a few, though. We have some fun when we when we get together. In fact, we delivered, well, you, you did all the work, but you delivered one of those babies on the air with me. That was a pretty that's, awesome oh, experience. That was, yeah, too. that was fun. That was one of, that's one of the highlights of my radio life, really. That's that was lots of fun. Pretty awesome. Um, but it's been a couple of years now since I, we checked in and we got to talk with you. Still delivering those babies, right? Still, I've I've uh, changed my practice focus a little. I spend some uh, I spend my mornings doing administrative things in the hospital, but I spend my afternoons still doing my first love, which is obstetrics, and I still take call and deliver babies in the hospital. You've you're in the front office now, part time at least. Part time, it's uh, I took on this. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I took on this job as a physician advisor, mm-hmm. and sl- slowly sort of um, transitioned over to it. I, I I couldn't go all the way because I I just couldn't leave clinical medicine. Yeah, this is my forty first year. Congratulations um, on that. Thank you. <laughs> and so I moved out of the primary care family practice, but I still do obstetrics. So I still see. Uh, pregnant girls in the afternoons and I still take call and deliver at the hospital but my mornings are filled up with doing more things uh, related to uh, it's not I mean I guess you could say administrative stuff but it's focusing on uh, length of stay and other patient care issues in the hospital and I find it's very interesting yes there's a there's a nice sharp little learning curve involved in it the last time we talked, you said when you first, many years ago, when you first took this position at the hospital, you had to, you, you forced them to amend their bylaws. Do you remember this conversation? Uh, yeah, I remember how I, <laughs> I, I, I remember how I um, lured them into amending their bylaws. Tell me about it. <laughs> well, they, we were the, our practice was the, the hospital owns a lot of, several medical practices now, but back then we were the very first. And they had bylaws that prohibited wearing blue jeans. That's right. <laughs> and and so I... Uh, <laughs> You're a cowboy doctor, yeah. and you said, I want to work there, but I'm not wearing uh, I'm not wearing a suit for anybody. Was it something like that? I just, I, I mean, they didn't push me on it. I just thought, I just, I'd worn blue jeans every... My career started on the Indian Reservation, the Apache Reservation in eastern Arizona, and I wore blue jeans to work every day, and then I just kept doing it in private practice. And yeah. so I was like probably worn blue jeans every day of my life for the last 40 years <laughs> and and that was I mean that was important enough to me to bring it up and it was apparently important enough to them that they changed their amended their bylaws and so now you're working at least part-time in the administrative side of this hospital They're still wearing blue jeans <laughs> that was the follow-up question <laughs> they haven't gotten you to put on some dress slacks or anything like that no they kind of Put up with me as as is. They know that. They know at this point. They know what they're getting from you. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure. They, I'm pretty sure they know what they're getting. Yeah, yeah. That's been illuminating for you to take on this this other role. You, you know, it's something that I have students, and now the students get sort of their experience gets sort of cut in half. Half of it this administrative stuff, and then half of it the obstetrical part of it, and. I think ever ever the ones I've had in this last year, they all it's eye opening for them. It was eye opening for me. The things that really go on I don't want to say they're behind the scenes, but the things that go on in the hospital that even as a practicing physician there you have really no idea about. I mean the case management deals with properly getting the patient in the I I don't want to say really managed, but they it's case management, it's utilization review, it's discharge planning. These people are ones that basically, they can make or break the economics of a hospital. 
and they're and they're right in the middle of patient care and wh- wh- what do we do with these patients after they leave and 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 the group there's like over 20 of them yeah <clears throat> if you would asked me a couple of years ago what they do i wouldn't have the i'm not so sure i have the great best idea now but yeah Back then, I, would, I just had no idea. So you have students who come in and train with you, and you just said their clinical time gets cut in half because you're here and then you're over in administration. But I wonder um, what you're learning over there, if you're able to share some of that, or some of that insight. That's like when, when I was, when, before you got here today, I'm reading <clears throat> articles on uh, what we call acute coronary syndrome and congestive heart failure. As they, as they relate to how we handle patients that come through the emergency department and are admitted to the hospital and what their status is when they come in. And that's, I mean, and so just that is very stimulating to go back through the medicine part of that. Every morning I go to rounds in two different places. One is what's called the clinical decision-making unit where we're trying to determine the admission status of the patients. Are they really... Do they really qualify to be admitted to the hospital, or are they, or are they what we call observation patients? They're still technically outpatients, although they're parked in the hospital. And so I go to that meeting every morning, and then I go to a second rounds where we go over the patients that are in the the PCU, which is the sort of the step down unit from the ICU, and it's a little bit higher acuity than most of the inpatients, but a little lower acuity than the ICU patients. And that's very, you know, it's full of medicine. And I, I mean, from my background, from my primary care background, I particularly enjoy the obstetrical patients that I have that have some that have medical comorbidities, because that's very interesting to me. Yeah. And it's, you know, and I like to spend the time, um, sort of, uh, getting into the intricacies and the details of caring for those patients. I, I'm not. Like a, as a physician advisor, I'm not caring for anybody directly, but let me give you an ex- example. We will review somebody and we'll look at some stuff. And like yesterday, we looked at a lady and her sodium was really low, but she was still on a medicine that would keep it low. Mm-hmm. And so we discussed that amongst the clinical lead and the case management person. And that, then that information will get back to the attending physician so that I mean, it's not like we're sitting telling anybody how to practice medicine, but we're we're sort of we may, being the case management person, and even more so the clinical lead in the PCU, she get the information back to him, and that will facilitate maybe a little bit better care of that patient without us sitting there and threatening the threatening a physician and, <clears throat> and without us really knowing truly exactly all that's going on because we're not there in front of the, in front of the patient, but we're able to look at that data. And we're, and basically what we're there for, is, I mean, there's some quality improvement, but we're really there to impact that and to impact length of stay because uh, that can always be improved. It's upon. in everybody's interests to keep the length of stay down, yes? A- absolutely. I mean, it, the hospital's a dangerous place. You get sick if you stay here too long. There's, yeah. You know, it's a focal point for a lot of diseases. Like 25 years or 41 years. You yeah. Get, get sick if you stay too long. Yeah, well, I was thinking more of the ones that are in the bed every night. Oh, those ones, yeah. And having things shot into them and tests done on them and everything. Hey, I know another interest of yours has always been, I mean, um, medically underserved communities, you've signed up for that. You've done that all along, right? You did some some training initially in Houston and then after that, you were off into the, you worked in the migrant camps uh, in Colorado. You worked on a couple of reservations, correct? I was, I spent a, a year at a, at a migrant health clinic north of Denver. Mm-hmm. And then I came to the Fort Apache Indian Reservation in eastern Arizona. And I spent um, five years there. Yeah. From uh, 1976 to 1981. And then I moved off the edge of it and then spent another 10 years where we took care of a lot of those patients still. Yeah. And it seems to me that there's a, there's a certain mission there, right? Like you, you can expect to get, and there's no shortage of doctors in, in Houston or in Phoenix, but there's a real shortage if you're out in Eastern Arizona on the reservation. And it's, it's kind of a mission for you. That's, that's always been to serve in medically underserved communities. Is that safe to say? Yeah, that's I kind of brought that over here too because I spent then I spent twenty years going out twice a week to the a little over twenty years to the 
to Peach Springs to the take care of the do do uh, prenatal visits for the wallapai, and, and I spent six years going down to the canyon. I probably wouldn't have stopped that either one of those, but they had a. I mean, who knows how the Indian Health Service works, but they had a change in policy, so they brought somebody in that works out there that does that. I don't. I don't. You know, I don't know if they. We were doing it for free, so I don't know how that really saved them anything. And yeah, and th- there's a, and there's a little drop. Certainly, there's a little drop down in um, in quality of care because there's nobody out there that does obstetrics. They have a somebody sees those patients and goes in the canyon, but they're not. An ob- they, you know, they don't do obstetrics. And- the last time you and I talked, in fact, you know, or the last time we did a radio interview, I asked you about it. And you, it, it was right around the time you had just stopped going, and I and I was saying, well, why? I don't understand why. And I, you didn't really go into it, but I had a feeling there was some kind of political something or other going it, on. It's nothing that we didn't get any. I mean, no, but we, I, we just said you know, they just said you know <laughs> stop coming. Yeah, that's that's basically that's it. That's crazy was, to me. You know, it wasn't, there was no, um, you know, that's what it was. It was, uh, part, there was a change in the, like the clinical director out there, the head of the of the Wallapai Reservation that we knew were well or close to, she, re, she retired, mm-hmm. and then they brought in a new medical director, but nobody ever, you know, there, you know there, there's no little note or no little dinner or no little thank you or anything. Not that we did it for that, but but it's... And it and it's so there wasn't you know there it's wasn't sad, a, right. I found it to be um, you know it was sort of double edged. It was kind of a I mean it was it was an effort uh, it was an effort to get up at five in the morning and load the horses and feed your horses and load them and take them there and ride in and come out. But it was it was always a day well spent. Sure, going to Peach, we would leave every other Thursday afternoon, drive out there and see anywhere from three to four to 10 to 12 pregnant girls and, and know that they were getting, you know, know they were getting good care. And these are girls who uh, otherwise I'd say it's pretty likely, right? They, they wouldn't have that prenatal care they would need. Well, they would get, they would get it, but they're getting it from somebody out there that doesn't deliver babies. Right. And so it's, it's different. I mean, yeah. they, most of those women come in and we deliver them anyway. They come in here I got it. and some of them come in here not from the canyon, not from Supai, but from from Peach. They come in here and have their prenatal care, and a lot of those are people I've delivered right. several to, sure. several of their children. Sure. Yeah, but that I think that was. But you know that's part of the. Um, that's just part of the way it is. Yeah. That, that's part of the way it is dealing with the Indian Health Service, and I know that. I mean. And, I mean, I know we had a great relationship with the working staff out there, the clinic staff, and I, they always liked it. They they liked us coming, liked to see us. I'm and sure. We, yeah. I don't you know, know what and, and we all and we took all comers. You know, anybody that there's was nothing to dislike about it. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, if they were, if it's someone, we we encouraged people to come in. If they were late, I didn't care. As long whenever they showed up, we'd see them if we were there. <laughs> It's time for a quick break on Focus on Your Health. We'll be back in a moment for more with Dr. Ken Jackson. Stick around. Welcome back to Focus on Your Health. I'm T.G. Lafredo, and this week my guest is Dr. Ken Jackson. We're talking medical missions and 41 years of practicing medicine. So I think 
you know, I know that was important to you, and I think, oh, what, what a shame that those missions are over. But wait, you've taken up a different sort of medical mission over recent years. Yeah, I've taken up. Um, I, my, I, I've gone to Honduras. I've done a couple of medical missions there, and, and my daughter, I have a daughter who's a psychiatrist in Miami, and she's married to a Honduran, and they, a couple, let's see, a year and a half ago, we did a mission down in in inland, let's see, southwest Honduras. We f- flew into Tegucigalpa and then went to that, went out in the country. And it was a, it was a very, that was a very different experience. There were, I mean, it's sort of straight, it's, you fly into the airport and there's, you know, people, you know, there's soldiers with semi-automatic weapons just patrolling yeah. around. Yeah. And on on that first mission, we had two soldiers with with their loaded rifles that accompanied us and were with us the entire time. Really? I never felt at risk or anything. I, in fact, I, I felt a little bit more concerned about the soldiers. The soldiers themselves. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> just not sure what was going to happen. But And we stayed in a... We stayed in a place that was a, I mean, what would you call it? I mean, it had a, it was a, a more like a compound. I mean, there, there was, there were eight foot walls and razor wire around it. Yeah. So it's like being in jail. Well, it wasn't quite that bad. <laughs> they had Wi-Fi. <laughs> and, but we stayed there and that was a group with, th- that first mission was set up by a friend of hers who was, a, I think she was Colombian, but it just overwhelmed her. And so we sort of took over and made it work. But the, uh, a, a surgeon came down, and he operated in the local hospital, with a, and a Honduran nurse came with him. And then I had two medical students that came, and I, I was there. And then we uh, met a, um, a Honduran pediatrician, a young guy. And every day, for three days, we would go out and drive out to the the village of uh, Tular, which is out farther from where we were staying. <clears throat> I can do this right. You can edit this right. <clears throat> um, and <laughs> I can, or I can leave it in. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> the first, I mean, that first morning we got there, it was it was an amazing thing. It was there were two hundred people waiting in the front yard for us. Two hundred patients. And so, and we just went at it. I mean, we, what was the work like when you started seeing this? You know, patients? it was kind of, it was sort of it was sort of rewarding yet not totally f- fulfilling because we're doing episodic care and they're gone and we're gone. Right. I mean, we're there for that week and then we're gone. Right. And so we we gave away literally thousands of dollars worth of medication. And so we treat, and so it's mostly episodic care. It's not like we're seeing people that had established established care, and we're taking care of their diabetes and their hypertension. Some of them had seen, uh, <clears throat> had had some medical care, and they, and there were some exotic illnesses they have, but most of them were treating their parasites, right. giving uh, giving away vitamins, uh, non steroidal anti inflammatories like Aleve and Advil. And and doing a little bit of diagnostic work, but there's not a lot of that you could do. These people are, you know, these there's some of these people that are tough. They're like 94 year old guys that worked in the field their whole life. Were they, and they were essentially all rural, poor, all, and, and never really see doctors at all. <clears throat> Probably not. Yeah. And so that, 94 is pretty good. <laughs> that, listen, they were they were, and they were every every single one of them. They were so grateful. And the staff that was at this place, it was oh, it was kind of, kind of inside outside, and and every day, every we're there in June, okay, and every day the air conditioning goes. Well, first of all, the, I'm the old guy. They gave me the room that had the air conditioner in it, and every day the air conditioning goes out <laughs> for the entire place. Okay, but my uh, my son-in-law, he he was my interpreter. I was going to ask how your Spanish is. His, it's non-existent. He was my interpreter, and then my daughter, the psychiatrist, and my and and her mother-in-law, my son-in-law's mom. They they did the pharmacy. They organized the pharmacy, wow. and and we were just, I mean, 
we were, I mean, we were just pounding away the meds, and that, that was really the bottleneck. I mean, we stayed, spent like an hour at the end of the day just getting all the meds packaged and distributed to the patients because they'd fall behind. Yeah the our little pharmacy group would be but it was we were put up by some this big corporation this big melon corporation down there that's who owned the compound and fed us and every day and provided the transportation but it's we were in the this little place is probably a mile off the road and it's like every day there's a different thing to um, and so we went on this little dirt road and one day it's the cattle the next day it's the goats the next day it's a gigantic pig these are all in the middle of the road as we're going down there and and you see these horse drawn carts with these kids and these like five and ten gallon containers of water on the back and they were distributing water because there's no water to a lot of places they had some of them had electricity but like no running water yeah and it was it, it, I mean, it's just, I mean, eye-opening is probably a understate, is understated. What do you, what do you get from doing these missions? What's, what's in this for you? What do you take from it? Boy, um, let, I'm going to answer that first by telling you what, after 40 years I get from this job. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, we start with that, and then this is sort of a, Sure. You can kind of extrapolate it. I think it's, I get, first of all, I've always liked taking care of the underserved. I, I, you know, there's plenty, there's plenty of people that can take care of the people that can really afford it. I like the underserved. I, I mean, it's in our practice here, you know, it's fun to take care of the, you know, to deliver the doc, the doctor's wife and, and the the pharmacist and the teachers and but most of the people we take care of here are not you know they're they they are you know not as uh, not as economically as well off as that uh, but they're very you know they're just uh, I say that I'm talking about obstetrics and the older a lot take care of a lot of older people that are retired and but it's um. I can divide this up for the for the long term family practice patients that I did take care of. It's that I, I get a lot out of the relationship. You know, I come in in my blue jeans. I can ask them about. I mean, I can ask them about things because I've taken we've taken the time to talk about things. Be it, be it either the plight of their youngest son or. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot of the guys, I always enjoyed asking what the, what a day is like, these retired guys. What's a day like? Mm, yeah. What's a day in your life like? Yeah. The obstetrics is different. It, it's the, it's um, this younger, healthier crowd, female. And, and there's a, I mean, the, the, it, delivering babies is, is, there's really a kick to it. It's really fun, but there's also a danger to it. Yeah. I mean, we've had I mean, just a couple of weeks ago. We had this girl that had a what we call a placental abruption, and she almost died, and her baby did. And and these are life threatening events. And so, doing obstetrics, you have to embrace danger because it's there. And and I and I and I saw another patient just this week who had a. I mean, not that this happens that often because most of them are all really nice and pleasant. And sure. They go well. But another than she had a fetal demise at like about 16 weeks. And it was so, you know, nobody expected this. And after it happened and they, we got her, my partner, we got her delivered in the middle of the night. And I talked to her the next day and her husband was just sort of overwhelmed by it. We didn't, I mean, this, how is this happening? And I just... And then I said, what's the important thing about this is that we have the mom, your wife, we have her here healthy and capable of going on. I said, I know this, I know this, this wasn't in, you know, this is nothing you ever envisioned. And I know it's, dev the feelings are devastating. Some women say that a miscarriage is harder on them than the death of a young child because they never feel they never got to know that person. Yeah. And, but it's for us. It's 
You know, it's a it's not a way of life, but it's a fact of life that these things happen. And I really, really like I mean, like it's f- to be able to be there and to try to. I'm not rescuing that couple emotionally, but I'm you know, but I'm giving them you know, I'm giving them something to remember and and a little bit different, not necessarily a different way to look at it, but a way to look at it that is, hey, yeah, this I mean, this is awful, but. Here we are. But you, you have this opportunity to provide this voice in this moment where they really need a voice. They really need someone stable and some someone to offer some leadership. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times they don't get that. You know, they get someone who's either, and I'm talking about as a physician, who's either not comfortable doing that or they or that's not a priority to them. I am so sorry to interrupt right there, but we are out of time. So join me next time for part two of my interview with Dr. Ken Jackson. This has been Focus on Your Health. I'm T.G. Lafredo. If you'd like to write to me, I would love to hear from you. My email address is foyhradio at gmail.com. That's Focus on Your Health, foyhradio at gmail.com. That's it for this week. Please join me next time for the second half of my interview with Dr. Ken Jackson. Catch you then. You could gargle into the microphone. Use use that as an outtake if you want to.